So we had a presentation looking at a combination of nivolumab with azacitidine in patients with relapse or refractory acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, this study came out of uh, some preclinical work that we've been doing in collaboration with the immunotherapy platform at MD Anderson, which is led by Dr. Jim Allison and Pam Sharma. Uh, what we did is we looked at about 80 patients with AML, 40 of them with newly diagnosed AML and 40 with relapsed AML. And uh, with the help of the immunotherapy platform, we did a detailed flow cytometry analysis on different T-cell subsets from the bone marrow and peripheral blood of these patients, and also look for different checkpoint pathways. Uh, what we sound, saw is that after looking for about eight or nine different checkpoint pathways, uh, including PD-1, OX-40, TIM-3, LAC-3, ICOS, and others, the PD-1 seemed to be one of the immune checkpoint pathways that was highly regulated in the bone marrow aspirate in patients with uh, leukemia as compared to healthy donors. And so based on this, we uh, had a phase 1b2 study clinical trial that was done uh, that targeted the PD-1 pathway using a PD-1 inhibitor nivolumab with azacitidine in relapsed uh, AML patients. Uh, and so the study has been open a little bit more than uh, a year now, and we've enrolled uh, 53 patients on it. What we found is that we could administer both nivolumab at a standard dose of 3 milligram per kilogram on day 1 and 14, along with azacitidine at a standard dose of 75 milligrams per meter squared days 1 through 7 and the combination was well tolerated without any dose limiting toxicities. So then we expanded the study. Uh, in the 53 patients that we have been able to evaluate at this time, the overall response rate was about 35%, of which uh, complete remissions were seen in about 22%. So uh, this compares favorably to what we would expect with azacitidine alone or with prior aza combinations in relapsed AML where the response rate is usually about 14 to 16%. But more importantly than just the response rate is what we're seeing is that those who achieve a, especially a CR, those 22%, are having a very durable response. So out of those 13 patients, only one of them has lost the response and we have a follow-up for these patients from between four months to 16 months. So this is very unique in a relapsed AML setting where usually the median responses whether it's with azacitidine or other treatments, are usually somewhere in the range of three to six months. And we're seeing a median of nine to 10 months with some people out to 14, 15 months and maintaining response. And I think this will be the thing to look out for, the tail of the curve. Uh, the other thing we saw looking at the tolerability aspect is that in general, we didn't see significant worsening of cytopenias or worsening of infection, uh, but we did see that there was uh, immune-mediated organ toxicity, and this was seen in about 25% of the patients. The most common organs uh, that saw immune toxicities were the lung, so we saw some pneumonitis, some colitis, and uh, some nephritis. Now, immune toxicities have been seen in solid tumors as well, and the reporting is anywhere between 5 to 10 percent to 20 percent. But what we saw is different is that the organs that we had involved are different from the ones that have been known to have immune toxicity in solid tumor, where they usually see endocrine, liver, and skin. Also, in our patients, the immune toxicities occurred earlier, sometimes within the first four to 10 days of treatment, uh, and they responded very quickly to steroids. In fact, we would often give steroids as both a therapeutic and diagnostic test, and in most cases, in about 24 to 48 hours, you'd see significant improvement. And we were actually able to co continue all of the pa almost all of the patients on therapy with nivolumab, even if they had immune-mediated toxicity. So I think uh, overall, uh, we were happy with the response rate, we managed the toxicities, and then we looked at survival, and what we saw is that when we look at the entire group of salvage patients, which is a mixed group, some patients had earlier salvage, some had later, there was a trend towards improved survival as compared to what we had seen historically at our institution with azacitidine alone or other azacitidine combinations. But when we focused on the first salvage patients, uh, which was about half of the population in our uh, study, 26 patients, we saw there was a clear improvement and they had a median overall survival of 9.5 months, uh, which in a first salvage uh, with any type of therapy is quite encouraging. So uh, we think that there are leads here showing that both response rate and survival improve. And then I think the uh, important uh, additional factors that we had is we looked at a lot of immune correlative data. So we did both baseline bone marrows and then sequential bone marrows, end of cycle one, end of cycle two, and then every two cycles after that. And what we saw is that the patients who had a very high CD8 population in the bone marrow to begin with at baseline were the ones who had a better chance of response versus those who had less CD3, CD8 cells, less T cells in the bone marrow to begin with, it was very hard to push a response in them because the PD-1 inhibitor could not work with very few T cells there to work on. So this could be a biomarker that has been validated and shown in solid tumors in, in multiple times that looking at or selecting patients who already have a T cell infiltrate, which seems to be about 30, 35% of our patients. 
The second thing we saw is that on treatment, the responders who already started with more CD8s actually developed a more and more CD8 positive infiltrate uh, as they continue to have a response. So in association with a complete remission or clinical response, we were seeing development of an immune response or a favorable immune infiltrate. Um, and the third thing we saw, which is clinically important for us for our next studies, is that patients who didn't respond, not only did they have fewer T cells to begin with and fewer CD8s, but they also had very high CTLA-4 levels to begin with. And CTLA-4 is the other major immune checkpoint after PD-1. Uh, so this leads to the idea that if you have a high CTLA-4, you may not respond to PD-1, but you may respond to the combination. Also, we saw that in the non-responders, as we gave them more cycles, the CTLA-4 started high and became higher and higher. So again, the idea that if we combined a PD-1 and a CTLA-4 blockade, we may be able to avoid primary resistance, so incre increase the overall response rate and durability. And this has been shown, of course, in melanoma, lung cancer, renal, where the response rates are doubled or even sometimes tripled. And so that's our next direction. We're going to be opening a study with a uh, AZA plus NEVO plus AP in relapse and frontline AML and uh, excited to see the results. Coming out of ESMO, we've heard about this as being really the year of PDL one with its approval for frontline, uh, well, indications for frontline lung cancer. Any thoughts of how that will go forward? You mentioned lots of uh, potential combinations. Yeah, so I think, you know, in the heme malignancies, we've been a few years behind solid tumor. They started working with the PD-1, PDL one CTLA-4s about nine or 10 years ago, starting with melanoma, then lung, renal, bladder, head and neck. Um, so I think in the heme malignancies, especially in leukemia, this is very new. In fact, this is one of the first studies to look in a significant or a good number of patients, both for clinical responses, survival, and immune correlations. I think what we have learned from this study, you know, the gist of it is that there definitely is an immune infiltrate in AML patients, and it's very heterogeneous between patients. And it can be manipulated, especially in those patients who already have some immune infiltrate. Uh, what we've also learned is that there are multiple immune checkpoints, and it's not only one, the PD-1 that plays a role. Uh, CTLA-4 is important. In some other patients, so we didn't show this, but we are seeing that uh, OX40 and ICOS may also play a role. So I think as more of these studies are being done, and there are two other studies that have opened now, uh, one with the PDL1 inhibitor atezolizumab, another with another PDL1 inhibitor durvalumab, I think we will learn more and more about patterns of response, toxicities, and then what other immune checkpoints could be used in combination. The good news is that now uh, most companies uh, have checkpoint blockers for almost every checkpoint pathway. So it's just a matter of us finding out which patient would benefit from which combination. And I think this could be what we would call personalized immunotherapy, where we would be able to assess patients looking at their T cell profile, their immune checkpoint profile, and then put them into the right basket of you should get PD-1 plus CTLA-4, maybe you get PD-1 plus OX-40, and maybe some of them just PD-1 alone. And this is now happening in lymphoma and solid tumors. And I think in the next one, one and a half year, similar studies will be coming in leukemias.